It is now time for question period. The member from Parliament, Norfolk. Good morning, Speaker. To the Premier, your government announced on Tuesday that it's asking for a comment on an 80 per cent reduction of neonicotinoid pesticides by 2017. Now, the uh, grain farmers of Ontario project this ban will cost them $630 million a year. But Health Canada has said there is no conclusive scientific evidence that this ban will cut bee mortality rates. Your government said it would only take action if there was conclusive scientific evidence that neonics are a problem. Yet in a scrum yesterday, your Minister of the Environment said, and I quote, all of the science is inconclusive. Premier, why are you cutting neonics by 80% and hurting farmers without the conclusive research evidence necessary to back it up? Questions? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, you know, I want to thank the member opposite for the question. This is a very important issue. Of course, it is important to our grain and oilseed farmers, Mr. Speaker. It is important for beekeepers across the province. But, Mr. Speaker, there is a much greater issue at here. It, it, there is a much greater issue at uh, at stake here, Mr. Speaker, and that is the health of pollinators across the province and, quite frankly, across the country, and the ability for us to have a healthy ecosystem. And so, Mr. Speaker, uh, what I said, uh, beginning when I was uh, Minister of Agriculture uh, and Food, and what I uh, continue to say is that we need to make sure that we take the competing interests, because there are competing interests, and we, we act in the context of the, the greatest interest, which is that we have a healthy ecosystem Answer. and that we preserve that ecosystem for our children and our grandchildren, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, we, we do both agree there is an issue with bee health and mortality in Ontario. In fact, you took the initiative, you created the Bee Health Working Group to study the problem, and when the group reported, they didn't recommend a ban, they didn't recommend a reduction of neonics. What they did re recommend were new best practices for using neonics during planting, because the planting process is when the insecticide can be transferred through airborne dust. Those recommendations were acted on during planting last spring, for example, the use of dust-reducing lubricant. And as a result, uh, we are told bee deaths were cut by 70%. Premier, farmers are doing their part to cut bee mortality. Why punish them for the progress they have achieved? Well, and I, I know that uh, I know that the uh, Minister of Environment and Climate Change will want to uh, speak to this, but let me just say that we know that uh, Ontario's economy is driven by a strong agricultural sector. Um, the sector relies on pollinators to be productive, Mr. Speaker, and so we we have we have worked with the Bee Working Group. Order, Mr. Speaker. please. The reality is that best practices do point to a reduction in the use of neonicotinoids, Mr. Speaker, and that is what we're doing. What we're saying is that we have set an aspirational target uh, to reduce the use of neonicotinoid treated corn and soybean seed by 80% by 2017. So we are not we are not proposing a ban, Mr. Speaker. We are proposing a reduction. We are proposing a different way of using this pesticide. So we are uh, we are working Answer. very hard to achieve an overwinter honeybee mortality rate of 15% by 2020. That is Thank our you. that is our target, Mr. Yep. Speaker. Back to the Premier. I used to work for Omafra's Premier. I remember the extensive pest management training. I remember the efforts that went into educating and encouraging farmers to embrace conservation tillage. Today, in 2014, Premier, farmers are doing their best. They all, it's the norm for them to have environmental farm plants. You should know that as a former Minister of Agriculture. Ontario farmers are outstanding environmental stewards, Order, please. and now seemingly you're asking them to go back in time using conventional tillage practices and more and pesticides that are more harmful to the environment. So, Premier, going backwards is not an option for Ontario farmers. So I ask you today, what is the alternative practice that you're going to encourage them? Well, Mr. Speaker, I would, I would ask 
ask the member opposite, what is the alternative if we lose our pollinators? And the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that we are going to work with the farmers. I have, I have had many conversations with the uh, head of the uh, um, grain and oilseed farmers, Mr. Speaker. I understand the concerns, and I have committed to continue to work with them. We have set some aspirational targets to change the practice. That'll do. Don't worry, I'll get down to the individual. Finish, please. We have, uh, we have set some aspirational targets, Mr. Speaker. There is time to continue to work with the farmers. They know that. I've had person-to-person uh, -person conversations with them. I will be meeting many of them tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. But the practices, yes, the practices do need to change, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to work with them to make sure that they do. Thank you. New question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Premier, for three years we've been asking for a line-by-line -line budget for the Pan Am Games. Yesterday we found out the reason that we've never gotten one. Budget apparently has a much different meaning if you're a Liberal cabinet minister than it does for regular people in the province of Ontario. $121 million was set aside for security. $245 million is actually being spent so oh, far. The Auditor General's yeah. report showed that $39 million was set aside for a security contractor. $81 million oh, was actually spent and was in the budget. The reason? Only half the job was actually budgeted for when the contract was put out. So, Premier, who's being held responsible for this level of incompetence at Pan Am? And if you won't punish those who are Washington. responsible, aren't you just encouraging this kind of incompetence to continue there? Yeah, yeah. Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, I had the opportunity to start my day in a gym this morning with uh, some young people. We were making an announcement with the Minister of Health, uh, Minister of uh, Education, and Minister of uh, um, Long-Term Care and Wellness, and we were uh, we were talking about moving to having 60 minutes of physical activity in schools across this province, partnering with Ophia and with Canadian Tire. And in that gym, Mr. Speaker, were a number of athletes who are right now training for the Pan and the Parapan American Games. I think if the member opposite asked those young people the price that they would put on their security, Mr. Speaker, I think what those young people would say is, you know what? It's your responsibility to do everything you can to keep me safe. I'm going to train every day. I'm going to train eight hours a day yes, on the trampoline, on the track, in the pool. You, government, you keep us safe. That's your job. Thank you. You see it, please. Thank you. Supplementary. So, Speaker, if uh, budgeting were a Pan Am sport, They'd be gold this medals. government would be disqualified for incompetence enhancing drugs. They don't know what they're doing. They can't even answer a question about budgeting. Premier, the auditor's report yesterday had more revelations about management problems at Pan Am. Had the security contracts been put up for bid earlier, it would have saved taxpayers money. Had the government factored new police contracts into its security costs instead of basing the costs on contracts it knew would expire before the games, it might have had something that resembled an actual cost for security. Had the government not underestimated the number of venue operating days by a whopping 317 per cent, it might not have ended up with a security contract that came in 106 per cent over budget. This is some pretty basic stuff. The TO 2015 is missing here, Question. and the Ministry of Community Safety has messed up. Premier, will someone be held responsible, or will accountability be yet another thing that's overlooked at the Pan Am Games? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, a, a, many of these questions were answered at the technical briefings, to which the member opposite did not attend, Mr. Speaker. So, so you know, I, we're happy we're happy to provide the information. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to just go back to my original answer because this member has made some pretty outrageous statements, in my opinion, about these games. He said on September 30th uh, this year, there's no comparison between the Pan Am Games and the Olympic Games. These are two-tiered games that we're having here. So he also said on July 17th, there's no reason to cheer about these games, and everybody out there knows it. I 
I take him back to the gym this morning, Mr. Speaker, where there are young people who are training eight hours a day. They're getting ready for the Pan Parapan Games, Mr. Speaker. They are racing in their wheelchairs. They are diving into pools. Yes, they are jumping on trampolines, and they are getting ready for the Pan Parapan yep. and the Olympics, Mr. Speaker. Yep. I would ask him to look at Thank those you. young people in the face and make yeah. those. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, that was a gold medal performance and deflection. You can't answer a single question about the budget for the Pan Am Games. You can't do it because it's a pipe dream for you. The budget doesn't matter. Order. I know. It actually helped. Thank you. Final supplementary, please. Thank you, Speaker. We're not talking about the athletes here and their performances. Our Canadian athletes are going to be great. We're talking about budgets, and we're talking about missing deadlines. You don't understand it, Premier. You don't understand anything about the Pan Am Games. You're even— Sorry. Stop the clock. The Minister of Culture, Tourism and Sport will come to order. I'm trying. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Budgeting seems to be a lost art for your government. This week it came out you guys are spending $400,000 on a porcupine for the Pan Am oh, Games, for goodness sakes. Me. Come on, Premier, this is ridiculous. Will you commit to holding Pan Am officials accountable Question. if they miss one more deadline or blow through another budget, or will you just pay whatever invoice comes onto your desk, whatever cost is necessary for the taxpayer? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, you know, the member opposite is talking about the budgets. I'm very pleased that the Auditor General was able to look at the uh, look at the numbers, Mr. Speaker. Her report confirms that the procurement of private security was transparent and fair, Mr. Speaker. She confirms and contradicts, Mr. Speaker, the claims of the opposition. What she said is that the, the budget for the security of the athletes, spectators and volunteers is $239.5 million, Mr. Speaker, and it's part of the budget that she has said is reasonable. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that those security costs can evolve. And I am talking about the athletes because the safety of people like Rosie McLennan and Josh Cassidy and Damian Warner, who are some of Ontario's finest athletes. Athletes, Mr. Speaker, it is their safety and it is their performance that we are talking about when we talk about the Pan Parapan Games, Mr. Speaker. I hope that at some point the member opposite can understand that and can understand that this is about the athletes. The member from Prince Edward Hastings, second time, will come to order. And you know what that means. I'm going to uh, remind people I've stopped the clock for a purpose. I, I am getting quite frustrated with people yelling across the floor, one, two, yelling across the floor people's names that you're not following the convention of the House, and I'm getting tired of it. It elevates the excitement, it doesn't bring it down, and I want you to bring this down to intelligent question and answer and debate. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, 87 per cent of women in Canada say they've been harassed at one point or another. It's reality, plain and simple, Speaker. Yesterday, the House passed a motion for to a select the committee on sexual— To the Premier, sorry, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, sp yesterday, the House passed a motion for a select committee on sexual harassment to be struck. I was proud to support, support that motion, Speaker, as were my colleagues uh, here in the NDP caucus. But here's the reality in Ontario. Funds for victim services are being cut. We're still waiting for the government to impl implement the recommendations of the coroner's inquest into the murder of Lori DuPont. Employers and employees don't have clear tools to deal with harassment in the workplace. Speaker, we need to act now. When is the Premier going to actually strike a committee on sexual harassment? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I 
appreciate the question from the member opposite. We also, uh, um, I understand that the uh, the House supported the uh, motion because, in essence, we believe that there needs to be a, a committee struck. And I have said, Mr. Speaker, that we should move ahead with that, and we will move ahead as uh, as expeditiously as possible. Um, and you know, I hope that I hope that we can agree that there are many voices that need to be heard on this subject, Mr. Speaker. So we need to hear from young people. We need to hear from Aboriginal women. We need to hear from the LGBTQ community. We need to hear from visible minorities because this is an issue that affects all people across the uh, across society. And so my hope would be that the work of that committee, which will be struck, Mr. Speaker, in the tradition of this uh, of this legislature, um, and I, my hope would be that that committee would would consult yes, broadly with people from all groups, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. We are at a unique and important part point in time. Sexual harassment is being discussed publicly and openly in a way that it really never has before in history, Speaker. We need to send a clear message, a very clear message, that sexual harassment is an issue that we can talk about without politics and without partisanship. So when will the Premier actually strike a non-partisan select committee of this legislature to deal with this issue? Well, Mr. Speaker, as I have said, striking an all-party committee is something that I agree with. I have said from the beginning that I was open to it, from the time the uh, member of the uh, official opposition asked for this. I said I was open to it. I think we need to move ahead and do that. And, Mr. Speaker, as a uh, nonpartisan, as all party committees have been struck uh, under the Conservative government, under the NDP government, and under the, the Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, we will form that committee as it reflects this legislature. That is the tradition of the place. It is what has been done under every party, Mr. Speaker, and I believe that we should continue in that tradition. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, there are a lot of things that we don't agree on in this legislature, in this House. The Premier and I are both women who lead our political parties. Uh, we agree, I think, as do the Conservatives here, that sexual harassment is an issue that needs to be dealt with here in Ontario. So let's get on with it, Speaker. This House sent a message that is plain and simple. Stop playing politics. Politics. Stop pretending that this is something that cannot be done in a way that isn't partisan and isn't a political football. Sorry. Stop the clock. The Minister of Finance will come to order. Please finish. Strike the committee on this issue. Strike the select committee so that it reflects all of the voices in this legislature in an equal way. And I need to ask, finally, when will this Premier do the right thing and make sure that this committee is established? When is it going to happen? Well, Mr. Speaker, I understand that the leader of the third party is taking a ferocious uh, approach on this. I am just as ferocious on this, Mr. Speaker, and the reality is that I have said yes, we need to have a committee. I have said yes, we need to do this as soon as possible, and the House leaders are going to work on that, Mr. Speaker. I have said yes, it is, we need to have an all-party committee, and yes, we need to have many voices weigh in on this issue, Mr. Speaker. This is an important moment. I have said all also that we need to strike that committee it, as it reflects this legislature, as every select committee, Mr. Speaker, under the Conservatives, under the NDP, and under the Liberals has been done. That's how we're going to move forward, Mr. Speaker. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. With all due respect, the leader of the third party needs to ask who is injecting politics into this, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Mr. Speaker, but I have to say I will not, not be embarrassed for being passionate about this issue. I am disgraced. That is a disgrace the way you responded. A disgrace. My next question is uh, on a different issue, Speaker. Last week, the legislature got behind the NDP plan for a national $15 a day childcare program that is being spearheaded across this country by Thomas Mulcair. I was proud that our legislature and Ontario, our, our province sent a very strong message that we. Stop the clock. I. Uh... 
<laughs> and I, uh, I didn't get the house quiet for you to interject. Please finish. I was proud that Ontario, that our province, sent a strong message that we want affordable childcare here in our province. But the Liberals are cutting millions of dollars out of childcare, Speaker. Can the Premier explain to parents why she's slashing budgets for childcare centres across 18 communities? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And in fact, uh, the number of, of spa child care spaces has actually increased over the last year. I'm sorry, the, one of the things, one of the things about having licensed the member from Simcoe centers, North come to order, please. We actually know how many spots we have licensed, and since we took office in 2003, yeah. the number of licensed child care spots in Ontario has increased by 130. If you look at each of the last four or five years, the number of licensed child care spaces has increased by 18,000 each year. Each wow. year, on average, the number of licensed child care spaces has increased by 18,000. Answer. And if you look at the funding, it's doubled. So I'm not really quite sure what the problem is. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, by cutting funding from public not-for-profit child care centres, the Premier is taking a step backward when we should be moving forward. Because of Liberal cuts, Speaker, the Coronation uh, Park Day Nursery in Sarnia, a not-for-profit child care centre that provides has provided child care since 1972, is closing its doors tomorrow, Speaker. And 100 parents are going to have to be stuck trying to find reliable, safe, affordable child care in that community. For once, could the Premier's actions actually support her words? Will she restore the funding for Coronation Park Day Nursery and make sure that the cuts to childcare that are happening right now stop in this province? Thank you. Minister of well, let me go back to the point that I was making at the end of, the, of my comments. The truth is that we have more than doubled the funding to childcare since 2003. In fact, we now spend over a billion dollars on childcare. I think you will find that the decision to close this particular childcare, which is operated by a municipality, was made by the municipality. Oh, but, that, so, but what does remain as the absolute funding history is, in fact, we have increased the funding ch to child care each and every year we have been in office, including this year. Stuck holding the bag because this government is not funding at appropriate levels, levels and they're making cuts that are forcing them into these untenable decisions. Ontario is behind a $15 a day childcare plan, apparently. We all voted for it in this House, yet the Premier is slashing funding to childcare. Coronation Park is actually closing its doors tomorrow. That's only one childcare centre, over 18 communities that are seeing the same kind of thing happening. I can't believe it that this minister refuses to acknowledge what's really happening. Not what happened last year, not what happened in 2003, but what's happening right now, what's happening tomorrow in 2014. Why is this Premier and this Liberal government taking us backwards when we should be moving forward on a plan Question. for safe, affordable, licensed childcare in this province? Thank you. Minister. Well, the, the member opposite wants to know what's going on this year with funding. So I would just draw to our attention that while we increased funding uh, by $90 million in 2012-13, $68 million in 2013-14, and $84 million in 2014-15, that would be this year, Speaker. We did, in fact, increase funding to child care by $84 million this year, and we'll continue to do so in future years. Those are the facts. Thank you. Any question? The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. 
Minister, $2.7 billion is waiting for Ontario in the Building Canada Fund for Infrastructure. While your government has yet to submit a list of projects for this application, you were quoted last week stating that the upcoming application from Ontario is unlikely to include a request for infrastructure funding for the Ring of Fire. Minister, could you please let us know which specific infrastructure projects are more important to your government than making the Ring of Fire a reality? Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm delighted that the members raised this question in the legislature because it gives me a, an opportunity to share with all of my colleagues here the challenge that we have had with the federal government on this program. Mr. Speaker, since March, we've been asking the federal government to share the details of the program with us that will help us in, our, in prioritizing what programs we're going to put forward. It was only this week, Mr. Speaker, after numerous requests that our staff were invited down, down to Ottawa to be able to see this information. So finally, Mr. Speaker, we have the information we need. We're going to be prioritizing our projects. But Mr. Speaker, what the government's been doing with infrastructure program, programs here, here in Ontario and across the country is playing games with projects like the Ring of Fire, trying to suggest that, they, that their portion should be funded from programs that are, are to go to roads, bridges, transit. Answer. And other important infrastructure. They need to do what our Minister of Northern Development Mines has done, have a separate funding proposal for a billion dollars to go to infrastructure Thank in you. the Ring of Fire. That's what they need to do. Well, again, to the Minister. Minister, it's hard to believe that Cliffs Natural Resources at one time predicted that they would have a mine producing chromite from the Ring of Fire for refining Ontario by 2015. Wow. I find it interesting you choose to mention the federal government now. It was just over one year ago, as Cliffs made the decision to idle their project in the Ring of Fire, they specifically cited, quote, unfinished agreements with the Government of Ontario that are critical to the project's economic viability, close quote. Minister, how can you blame the federal government when the largest player in the Ring of Fire made such a clear indictment of your lack of action? Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's not a question of blame. It's a question of total lack of action on the part of the federal government. We've made a commitment in our last budget to fund infrastructure in the Ring of Fire to the tune of a billion dollars. Their commitment right now is zero. They have not made a commitment whatsoever. Just recently, they, they went forward with a further $6 billion in the small amount of infrastructure that they're funding across this, this country. And Mr. Speaker, that was to go to federal, federal buildings, federal projects, nothing for the Ring of Fire. They had an opportunity this week to match our commitment in the Ring of Fire. They failed this week. Thus far, they failed incredibly. Stop the clock, please. The members from uh, Leeds Grenville. Uh, Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, it's time for the, forward, the, the, the federal government to come forward with a proposal to match our commitment of a billion dollars in the Ring of Fire. Uh, they can keep playing games all they want with infrastructure projects. It's a very Answer. simple request. Match our funding. That's all we're asking. Thank you. New question, the member from Bramley, Gore Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Auditor General released a report very clearly addressing the issues of security in the Pan Am Games. The Auditor General makes it very clear that there are some serious concerns with respect to security costs in the Pan Am Games. The security budgets have doubled. The government is behind schedules in terms of signing contracts. And the Auditor says because of that, costs could go up. In fact, some of the private security contracts have more than doubled in just one year. But the Liberal ministers keep on insisting that everything is just fine, everything is just peachy. <laughs> so will the Premier tell Ontarians, did her Liberal ministers read the same report that everyone else read? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy to take the question from the member opposite. Uh, yesterday, the Auditor General put out a report that uh, confirmed what we've been saying all along, that. Um, uh, that this government uh, uh, followed the procurement uh, process in order to uh, in order to uh, provide that security need for the Pan Am Games. Uh, we're quite confident with TO 2015 and the work that they've been doing, and we're very uh, confident with the work that the ISU has been doing, which is made up uh, by the OPP, our federal and
and municipal uh, partners. And uh, I think we should uh, we should take their advice. They are the experts, and uh, we believe we're in good hands. And uh, we will not compromise the safety of Ontarians during these games. And uh, we have full faith in the OPP and TO 2015, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The question is about the security costs, and this is the Auditor General of Ontario, someone we entrust with the, the, the responsibility of ensuring that there's oversight. The Auditor General says that there's problems that this government is not addressing. It's very clear. And let me quote the Auditor. I quote, a lack of clear communication has led to a potential security gap. If this government is so concerned about security, why don't they address the security gap that the Auditor General has presented to you, has told you about? The games are less than eight months away, and we have no security for the fields where the Pan Am games are being played on. The auditor is clear that leaving plans to the last minute will cost us more. Higher costs in recruiting, higher costs in training and planning, and the list goes on. Will the Premier tell Ontarians how much it's going to cost to make this fix in the 11th hour? Thank you. Minister. Uh, to the minister responsible for community services and correctional services. Community, community safety, safety correctional services. Minister of community services. Yeah. <laughs> doing it. Minister of community <laughs> services and correctional services. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. And I, I, I do want to uh, uh, remind the member, jog his memory, as to how this Auditor General's report came about. I remember very distinctly in late March when I was appointed as the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. From day one, that party and that member were asking Speaker questions about the, the procurement process around a private security contract. They were questioning our, our, our procurement practice. They were questioning the award. They were questioning the bidder. In fact, they asked the Auditor General to look at the process uh, of their procurement. And this is, Speaker, what the Auditor General said in that regard. She said the All-Party Standing Committee on Public Accounts asked us to review the processes Answer. used to award security contracts for the Games. We found that the selection processes were fair and transparent in accordance with government procurement Thank policies you. and took into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Minister, I've noticed a large delegation of Ontario chiefs uh, at Queen's Park both yesterday and today, uh, and, and uh, I'm aware that uh, this government will be partaking in a series of roundtables with the delegation to continue to build and renew our relationship with First Nations in Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government has demonstrated its commitment to invest in First Nations, while the federal government continues to fall short on its responsibilities. Okay. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you inform the House on what this government has done to cement our relationship with the Chiefs of Ontario and the First Nations in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this government was responsible for creating the first standalone Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs in 2007. This, this reflected the importance we placed on developing a stronger and a broader partnership with First Nation communities in Ontario. This week's meetings represent another significant step in renewing our relationship and the journey toward reconciliation. Eight different roundtable sessions have been scheduled with various ministers and chiefs of Ontario. This highlights the accessible, transparent and open approach this government is taking. These roundtables provide a forum for meaningful conversations to take place on topics such as clean water, business development, poverty alleviation, murdered and missing Aboriginal women, and treaty awareness. Mr. Speaker, we want to have frank discussions Answer. on how we can work with First Nations in this province because when all communities succeed, this province Thank is you. going to be a better place. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, these roundtable sessions are significant and showcase the process, the progress this province continues uh, in, in strengthening the relationship with First Nations in Ontario. Uh, this is a great event organized by the Chiefs of Ontario organization, and I commend our government for being dedicated to these conversations with First Nation leaders from across Ontario. The minister has affirmed that this government takes its commitment to First Nation communities very seriously. 
I know our government is taking a leadership role in many issues impacting First Nations uh, and people in our province, and the minister highlighted some of the topics that we're discussing in these meetings. Uh, I look forward to my participation this afternoon in the Business Development and Poverty uh, Alleviation Session. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could the minister please inform the House on the significance of treaties and treaty awareness? Question. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> Thank you. Speaker, treaties represent the solemn agreements that we live together on this land and through the formal exchange of promises that created the rights and responsibilities of Canada, of Ontario, and of First Nations. And treaties are still a part of what we do today. For instance, with the Algonquins of Ontario, an agreement is being negotiated today in the 21st century. My mandate letter, Speaker, committed this government to moving forward with a treaty strategy that will promote constructive engagement with First Nation communities, revitalize treaty relationships, and improve socio-economic outcomes for Aboriginal people. Together, though, res together through respectful and meaningful dialogue, we will come to better understand about different perspectives on treaties and work together on practical solutions Answer. and practical initiatives that will continue to support our strong treaty relationships. Thank you. No question, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Senior citizens across Ontario are losing publicly funded home care services. According to these Indeed. patients and their families, there's no one in your ministry nor your bureaucracy, the Community Care Access Centres, or CCAC, willing to acknowledge the cuts, to stand up and to protect the critical home care services they need. This is the state of home care service on your government's watch today in Ontario. Minister, do you think it's acceptable, do you think it's justifiable to have our seniors' care cut? Thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, of course, I don't think it's acceptable. In fact, that's not what we're doing at all. We're dramatically increasing our funding to home and community care. And, Mr. Speaker, I have to say that I was hoping that this question was going to come from the NDP because I was going to offer the entire caucus a briefing on what we are doing for CCAC. I think I need to include the PCs as well in this briefing because the truth is absolutely contrary to what we're hearing. And we've dramatically increased, we've roughly doubled our funding to CCACs over the last decade, to community and home care. We've also increased $250 million this year alone, three quarters of a billion dollar increase in three years' time. Mr. Speaker, we know, and the opposition parties, both of them know, know our commitment to transferring more care closer to people's homes where they want to see that care, where it can be provided effectively and efficiently. We aren't cutting services. Answer. We aren't cutting costs. We're doing the opposite, Mr. Speaker. The CCAC, they have to. Thank you, Speaker. Back to Mr. Health Long Term Care. Well, Minister, I'd like to give you a briefing from the people that are calling my office, my That's colleagues, right. telling me there are cuts happening. You need one. It's appalling you need one. that you're going to spend $450,000 a month in interest for an empty Mars office building but cut frontline care to our seniors. We still have not heard you even acknowledge that there are cuts being made, and we're hearing it every day in our offices. Minister, we think your most important task is that you stand up and represent and provide services for our very needy seniors. Will you show leadership and issue a directive that funding will be restored to the CCACs ASAP? Here, good question. Again, Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that we speak accurately and with the facts. There is no funding to be restored, Mr. Speaker, because we've been increasing funding year over year to our CCACs and to and to and to to home and community care, and we're seeing the results in Northern Province. I know we've been talking about Erie St. Clair. The reality with Erie St. Clair, Mr. Speaker, is that we've doubled the funding over the last 10 years, a $3 million increase this year alone. The member from generally is the practice from right across this province, Mr. Speaker. A quarter of a billion dollars increased this year. That amount is going to increase by $750 million. Additional funding for home and community care. We're seeing the results. There is transformation under, under, underway. Gail Donner and a team of experts are looking at home and community care to see how we can continue to improve the services. We're Answer. Their report in the new year, and I look forward to their recommendations. Yeah. New question, the member from Kitchener-Waterloo. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday afternoon, we had final hearings on Bill 8, the so-called Transparency and Accountability Act. Uh, oh, to, to, I'm sorry, to Minister Matthews. A piece of legislation that, in fact, fails this province's most vulnerable children. 
Mr. Irwin Elman, the provincial advocate for children and youth, told members of the committee how it fails. He told the story of a 10-year-old boy in a group home who was put in physical restraints 108 times in a 13-month period. Mr. Elman added, it takes a great deal of courage for a child as vulnerable as those in my mandate to speak up. Those children who, with great strength, come forward, often alone and frightened, have a right to expect my office has all the tools it needs to assist them. Minister, you know that the NDP supports Mr. Elman's amendments to Bill 8. Will this government have the courage to help this province's most vulnerable children? President, Treasury Board. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for asking a very important question. Um, we're actually meeting today, Speaker, with the provincial advocate to discuss his proposals and a number of recommendations under consideration right now. And let me just say, too, that our goals of the government are the same as, as the advocates, and that is the best uh, care and support for children in our province so that they can reach our full potential. And Bill 8, as the member knows, uh, if passed, will give uh, uh, the provincial advocate new investigatory powers that have been modelled after other powers provided to the Ombudsman under the Ombudsman Act. So we do have the same goals, and uh, it's about child protection, safety, and helping children reach their full potential. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the minister knows what authority the children advocate needs and deserves. Mr. Elman has asked that he be given the power to investigate all children under his mandate. He's been asking for these changes year after year for the past six years. Bill 8 still excludes young people involved with youth justice, mental health, development services, children treatment centers, residential schools for the deaf, blind, and severely disabled children, as well as First Nations children and those with special needs. Right now, Ontario's Children's Advocate is the only independent officer of a legislature and the only child advocate in the country that doesn't have these powers. Speaker, why does this government continue to bring forward legislation that is designed to fail the children of this province? Minister. So, Speaker, we're very pleased with the, what is in Bill 8 right now to give that broader powers to the advocate when it comes to child welfare. And in addition, there are other accountability measures with Children's Aid Society. The member mentioned youth justice, so we've also ensured that the Ombudsman has oversight of all of our youth justice facilities. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing the outcome of the meeting today with the provincial advocate as this bill moves forward. I just want to say, though, Speaker, it was the third party, however, when given the chance, who uh, shot this bill down. They didn't want it to go forward. They refused to support the bill. Here we are. We have brought it back as the Premier uh, promised. We brought the bill back as is before the election, and now we're moving forward. I hope we'll have a good uh, resolution. And as I said, the, the answer does great work, and we all share the same goal, Speaker, which is the best interest of children in our Thank province. You. Thank you. Question, the member from Beaches, East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the ebullient Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, Ontario, please. Ontario's clean energy initiatives have attracted billions of dollars in new investments. They generated more than 40,000 jobs and significantly increased the amount of clean energy generated throughout the province. <coughs> Our government's elimination of coal-fired electricity in Ontario is the number one greenhouse gas reduction initiative across North America. It represents the equivalent of taking seven million cars off the road. Moving away from burning fossil fuels and toward renewable energy is helping Ontario meet its greenhouse gas reduction goals, improves our air quality, and is helping our economy grow towards a low-carbon solutions that meet our needs. Now, earlier this month, Health Canada released the results of a wind turbine noise study, and I'm sure the people of Ontario are very keen and interested in the results of that Question. study. Question. Well, would the Minister of Environment and Climate, and Climate Change please update the House? on the findings of Health Canada regarding wind turbine noise and its effects on health. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to my friend, the member for Beaches, 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 Beaches East York. East York. <laughs> um, and uh, I want to thank him for... for yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's been over a century since we Liberals have been able to say that with enthusiasm that we, uh, we can now say it. Um, so I'm... Uh, I, I very appreciate for his, his advocacy, and you know, closing coal plants was very important. But there has been a lot of, uh, I think, 
uh, misconceptions about wind turbines and their health impacts. And our, our friends in Ottawa Health Canada put out a study, Mr. Speaker, and I'd just like to actually read directly from Please. their report. Illness and chronic disease. No evidence was found to support a link between exposure to wind turbine noise and any of the self-reported illnesses uh, and chronic conditions as heart disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On stress, Mr. Speaker, which was yes, the sir. second area, uh, we, we were we were asking them and, and and the federal government asking them to look at. On the issue of stress, Mr. Speaker, no association was found between the multiple measures of stress, Thank you. and they list them. And I will continue in the supplemental, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again, my question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and I'm pleased to hear our government is moving forward with a science-based approach to renewable energy, and that Health Canada study supports the Ontario Chief Medical Officer of Health's findings that there were no links in stress, chronic degree, disease, or sleep between wind turbine noises and these adverse health impacts. It's important that Ontario continues its strong commitment to clean energy sources and moves us away from burning fossil fuels. And I'm sure my constituents in BC's East York are pleased to know that there are alternative energy sources, such as wind, that they are safe, clean, and sustainable way to meet our needs, and that a significant concern of those opposing wind turbines has been resolved. Speaker, through you, could the Minister of Environment and would he Please share with the House why it's important that we continue moving Question. Ontario towards safe and clean renewable energy. Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, it's important for a lot of reasons, but I, I just want to finish with the health piece because they went on to study sleep and a number of other other matters, Mr. Speaker, and Health Canada in every single case found no link between wind turbines and any negative health effects in any of the areas. And it's particularly interesting, Mr. Speaker, because. Claims have been made by members of the opposition that there were health issues, and, and now we know scientifically, clearly, that is not the case. Right. There are health issues with it's coal, there are health issues report. with transmission lines, there are health issues with all kinds of matters of things, but this is not. clean. The other piece that's very important, Mr. Speaker, uh, as Ontario right now is over 6 per cent below its 1990 GHG levels, we are actually one of the world leaders now in meeting and exceeding uh, global targets for GHG reductions. This is critical, not only for clean energy and the billions Answer. of investments and, do and dollars, but we couldn't get to our climate change goals without, uh, without the wind sector, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. A new question. A member from Simcoe North. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. And next, Minister, as you know, next week most of us will attend some inaugurals. Already I'm hearing difficult times are ahead for many, many, many of our municipalities. Huge taxation increases because of policing. The Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund is dwindling away. Now, what is really hard to bear are the inequities and discrimination that municipalities receive when they apply for infrastructure programs. It is clear that well-managed municipalities who actually have reserves set aside for specific projects have their applications rejected. And I can give you many examples of that, and I can give you letters to support that. Many of the mayors are saying, don't even send out the forms anymore, because all you're doing is wasting valuable time and money filling them out, only to be rejected over and over. So as minister, is it your intention to continue on this path, or will you begin to treat all municipal projects based on their merit and not on the good or bad management of the municipality? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, how do you answer a question like that? I mean, we have a great working relationship with municipalities. Uh, quite quite, quite uh, the, uh, the departure from the, I dare I say it, the previous government that downloaded many of the issues uh, uh, referenced uh, in passing. We're, we're investing uh, literally billions of dollars uh, with respect to uploading some of those issues that the previous government downloaded. We're engaged with housing issues. We're engaged with ice storm assistance with the feds. We're, we're, we're insisting, as AMO would have us insist, that there be accountability mechanisms and priorities set with respect to all these fundings, and that's exactly what we're doing and will continue to do. Thanks. Thank you. Supplementary. You know, Mr. Speaker, you never, ever get any kind of an answer. So, Minister, we know that your government operates on the credit card that our great-grandchildren will be paying off. And are you expecting municipalities to do the same? Some municipalities actually do care about their finances. 
So when all citizens of Ontario pay their provincial taxes, do you really Minister think it is fair that well-managed municipalities and their ratepayers are discriminated against so that infrastructure grants can be directed to those that have mismanaged in the past? And that's exactly what's happening. I don't know if you, if you get it or not, but that's exactly what's happening. So give the new council some credit. Give some clarity on whether it actually pays to be efficient in this in this province as a municipality. Because one thing we know for sure, we don't have a very efficient Liberal government. Well, look, uh, let, let's be uh, let's be perfectly frank uh, about this. Uh, municipal municipalities, uh, by and large, there's the odd ex exception where, where where there's a need for some special assistance, are well managed. You know, they work hard at ensuring they're well managed. We work together at making sure that the joint programs we offer are are transparent, accountable, and well managed. I'm proud of I'm proud of our municipal municipalities, all 444 of them across Ontario who struggle every single day to try to build stronger, healthier communities. So we're pleased to be engaged in that process with them. We'll continue to be engaged. I'm, I'm participating right now in a Building Bridges tour all across Ontario. I've visited and spoken directly with over 60, munici yes, 60 municipal councils. Count councils. They appreciate that. We're having that dialogue. We're making the kinds of changes to build stronger communities in Ontario. New question. There is a third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Recently, we learned through, through a newspaper investigation in Hamilton that the people of Ontario will never hear the results of an OPP probe of a botched murder investigation from many years ago. The reason? Well, we don't even know that, Speaker. And why don't we know, Speaker? Because the Information and Privacy Commissioner uh, of the day finally had to concede that she couldn't get the government to explain why they kept the probe's findings secret. Speaker, does the Premier think that it's right that the Information and Privacy Commissioner, an independent officer of this legislature, doesn't have the power to compel the government to provide information to the people of this province? Minister. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member opposite uh, for the question. I think the member opposite very much uh, well knows that this is a, uh, a matter that is before the courts uh, right now, which has been ac actively considered. It's been uh, subject to uh, 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 several years of litigation. Uh, and, Speaker, it would be highly inappropriate for, for myself, or the Premier, or any member of the government uh, to comment on this matter. Thank you. Speaker, this is a matter that the Information and Privacy Commissioner clearly stated should be open to the public. It's got nothing to do with the courts, and this government and this minister knows that very, very well. This case went all the way to the Supreme Court, Speaker. One man went to jail for seven years, and another was actually deported. The original police inge investigation was found to have used illegal wiretaps, and the conviction was thrown out, Speaker. Now, more than a decade later, a decade and a half almost, this government still won't release the results of the probe into what went wrong. They won't even explain why they refuse to tell us. Now, how can the openness and transparency premier ignore orders from her own information and privacy commissioner, her own watchdog speaker? Uh, uh, speaker, as I mentioned earlier, this this is a very much this is an issue that is very much before the courts and will be highly inappropriate for for any any members of the government uh, to to comment uh, to comment on that. Speaker, we know that our police officers do uh, extremely hard work, and we thank them for the the work uh, they do. Uh, in respect to the the re release of the report, uh, uh, Speaker, uh, the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services is very much. Uh, committed to fully complying with the, the provisions uh, of the Freedom of Information and Privacy Protection um, Act, and will uh, will comply with the uh, with the ruling uh, of the Information and Privacy Commissioner. But as this matter is still subject to ongoing legal proceedings, um, it is uh, it would not be appropriate uh, to get into any further details. Thank you. Thank you. New question: The member from Davenport. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Great. Minister, skilled tradespeople are vital to Ontario's economy. Our government established the Ontario College of Trades to give tradespeople and industry responsibility for regulating the skilled trades for the first time. In just over a year and a half of operation, the college has had a number of important successes as it fulfills its mandate to protect the public by regulating and promoting the skilled trades. For the first time, Ontarians can access a public register to view the credentials of professionals working in the skilled trades. Constituents in my riding of Davenport are pleased that they can rely on the public register to ensure that the skilled tradespeople they hire, especially in compulsory trades, have the appropriate qualifications. Minister, can you Question. inform the members of the House on how the College of Trades is regulating and promoting the skilled trades and supporting the highly skilled workers we need here in Thank Ontario? You. Mr. Training, College Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Davenport for that question. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario College of Trades has taken vital steps to regulate, modernize, and promote the skilled trades in Ontario. The college has helped promote careers in the trades as first choice professions for our students and is also doing important work to protect the public through the public registry. Since its inception, the college has done a review of 33 apprenticeship ratios, Mr. Speaker, reducing 14 of these ratios. The College of Trades has put the skilled trades on a similar footing with the teachers, doctors, dentists, and nurses who all have their own professional regulatory bodies. Mr. Speaker, our government believes that decisions regarding the skilled trades in Ontario should be made by the industry and tradespeople themselves, not by politicians. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. I'm pleased to hear that the Ontario Colleges of Trades has had some very important successes since its launch. Minister, I understand that after hearing the advice of industry leaders and tradespeople, our government has appointed Mr. Tony Dean to review some aspects of the, colleges, the College of Trades' work. I know that our government made a commitment to undertake this review, and I'm happy to hear that we have appointed such a highly qualified person. <laughs> Many of my constituents in Davenport are members of the Ontario College of Trades and are interested in understanding his role in greater depth. Minister, can you update the members of the House on what Mr. Dean's role will be and how his review will support the continued success of the college? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member again for that question. Mr. Speaker, to support the continued success of the college, our government has appointed Tony Dean for the role of reviewer. His job is to examine the trade classification review process and the issues related to the scope of the practice of trades, including their connection to enforcement. Mr. Speaker, our government fully supports tradespeople. That's why we have asked Mr. Dean to conduct this, his, this review to specific activities of the college. Mr. Dean's appointment, Mr. Speaker, has been welcomed by a diverse range of industry groups, and there is a, and there is a broad agreement that he is well qualified to address these issues. Mr. Speaker, it will continue to be a priority for our government to ensure that the College of Trades can carry out its mandate as effectively as possible. Answer. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent. New question. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Premier. Premier, earlier this year I reintroduced uh, an act to proclaim Christmas Tree Day. If passed, this legislation will designate the first Saturday in December of each year as Christmas Tree Day in Ontario. The U.S. has deemed the entire first week of December as National Christmas Tree Week. This effort has boosted Christmas tree sales considerably across the United States. Premier, the Christmas tree industry employs thousands of workers in the farming, transportation and retail sectors. More than one million fresh, farm-grown Christmas trees are purchased each year in Ontario, and the same number of seedlings are planted each year. There are 647 Christmas tree farmers in Ontario, or farms, I'm sorry, in Ontario, more than any other province. And so, Premier, in recognition of a rural industry that our province benefits greatly from, will you agree to unanimous consent of my bill and make Christmas Tree Day a reality? Question. Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Economic Development, uh, Employment and Infrastructure is going to want to, uh, is going to speak to this. I just want to say that uh, I think that it 
anything we can do to support the Christmas tree industry. I can remember as a, uh, as a young mom, we would take uh, our kids to Horton's Tree Farm. I'm not sure who's riding Horton's Tree Farm is in. Horton's Tree Farm, there you go, um, to, uh, to cut down a tree. I think it's a, it's a terrific uh, tradition, part of the, the season for people who, uh, who celebrate Christmas. And, um, you know, I would be, uh, be happy to follow up with the, with the leader of the opposition, and I know the Minister of Economic Development Trade will have something to say about this. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Premier, I'm not what, sure what to take of that answer, uh, whether it was a yes or, or a no. I'll just indicate that <clears throat> after question period, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'm going to ask for unanimous consent. I mean, the first Saturday of December comes very soon, and uh, you know this gives the industry an opportunity to encourage more consumers to buy Christmas trees. Um, we should know that they, the industry points out that the environmental benefits of Christmas trees, one acre of trees removes up to 13 tonnes of airborne pollutants. So we need to encourage this industry. I hope people aren't Grinches over there or over there, and that you'll join us in supporting this very, very important industry today. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Yes. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm waiting Employment and I'm, Infrastructure. I'm, I'm, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm waiting for my Christmas tree note to come, and it doesn't seem to be coming. <laughs> But I can tell you this, and I, I may have a bit of a conflict here. I have family in, in the Collingwood area, may well be your constituents, that are in this line of work that, that do farm Christmas trees. I don't know if they're still doing it, but they were years ago. And it is an important sector, and it's something that certainly I think the member raises a, a valid uh, concern. And I know it's an area that, he, in the area he represents, this is a, an, an important industry and something that I think all Ontarians can embrace. So. Let me take this uh, this time to wish everybody in this house uh, a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Encourage everyone to get their Christmas trees up. I know we're busy. Get to it. Get those Christmas lights up. Let's get in the spirit. And thank the member for bringing this to our attention. Any questions? Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, early as, earlier this month, when I asked the Minister of Health about CCAC slashing its services, he stated it just isn't true. Earlier this week, he described these service cuts to home care in Windsor as no cuts at all. But this weekend, in my riding, I will be meeting with more home care patients and their families who have been hit by these service cuts, just as I've done this entire month. People like Betty Terry, who's 89 and suffers from dementia, and Madeline Reitzel, who's 89 and has suffered from a stroke and needs constant care. With nursing visits slashed by one-third, my constituents are being left without the care they need. They are told these service cuts are missed. Will the minister finally do the right thing, admit Question. that these service cuts are real, and apologize to the people of Windsor for saying the exact opposite? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. You know, the, my job as Minister of Health is to ensure that those individuals across the province who do need care. Uh, are provided with that care, Mr. Speaker, and we're doing that in home and community care as well. Uh, in Windsor, in uh, Erie St. Clair, Mr. Speaker, we're not changing the criteria, uh, nor will anyone have a change in their services unless their objective assessment indicates that they require a change in their services. And sometimes that's an increase in services, Mr. Speaker, and sometimes that's a decrease in services, but it's made by our care coordinators, our health care professionals, in a very objective way through a Assessment. In, in Erie St. Clair, there is no wait list for nursing care, Mr. Speaker. There's no wait list for PSW care through our CCACs. Everyone needing yes, home sir. care in Erie, Erie St. Clair is getting home care. That policy is not changing. We're adding additional funds, as I've mentioned before, to be able to accommodate any increases. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I have a quote from the first vice president with the ONA. She, she states, I don't know whether he needs to come see, whether he needs to talk to the people whose services have been cut. I don't know why or how the minister can say there are no cuts. There is absolutely no excuse to cut home care services, services in Windsor, and no excuse for the minister to bury his head in the sand. These service cuts are spelled out in the CCAC memos and patients are feeling the effects each and every day. 
If the minister really thinks that there are no service cuts to home care in Windsor, he needs to order that the home care services that have already been reduced be fully restored immediately. So why does the minister continue to deny that these shocking service cuts, not funding, service cuts to home care are happening under his watch? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to speak uh, both with the CEO of the CCAC and Erie St. Clair, as well as with the CEO of the Lynn that has responsibility, and they're working together. In fact, there's a board meeting, an open board meeting today of the Lynn. The CCA CCO is uh, going to present. Uh, and I would encourage, you know, I look forward to the member opposite, frankly, any members in this legislature, if they have specific examples, specific individuals that they feel are not receiving the care that they're entitled to. I expect them, I in fact believe they have a responsibility to bring those specific cases to my attention. The, the third party has not done that in, a, in a, any specific example of bringing their responsibility to bring those people to my attention, and I look forward to hearing from that. And I would suggest that they follow the lead as well of the member from Sarnia Lambton, who is working with our Lynn, working with their CCA. It's their Thank you. Lynn, their CCAC, and there's meetings taking place. Thank you. The member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, point of order. I will now present the petition of right to the Attorney General. Okay. The, uh, all members have a, a, a right. It's not a point of order. All members have a right to walk any document back and forth between each other, and that's uh, an acceptable practice. Uh, the member, uh, the uh, Minister of the op Opposite, the Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I seek unanimous consent that the orders for second and third reading of Bill 16, an act to proclaim Christmas Tree Day, be called immediately, and that the questions on the motions for second and third reading of the bill be put immediately without debate or amendment. Mr. Wilson is seeking unanimous consent that the orders of the second and third reading of Bill 16, an act for claim Christmas tree, uh, be called immediately and that the question on the motions for second and third reading of the bill be put immediately without debate or amendment. Do we agree? No. I've heard enough. Um, order, please. Order, please. I um, order. As is the tradition and the convention in this place, uh, our guests are always welcome to be here, but I uh, would have to announce to you very clearly that you cannot do any demonstration of whatsoever, so I'd appreciate it if you could uh, follow the convention, and uh, we still welcome you here to, to, to be here uh, with, under, under those rules, so I appreciate that. Um, we have a deferred vote. And on the motion of the allocation of time on Bill 7, an act to enact the Burden Reduction Reporting Act 2014 and the Partnerships for Jobs and Growth Act 2014, calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. On November the 26th, Mr. Bradley moved government notice of motion number 10. All those in favor of the motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugas. Mr. Dugas. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Miss Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martins. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. All those <laughs> opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bantock. Mr. Bantock. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes being 48 and the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.